engineer who designed the revetment shore protection system that we have and the one that was built on the uh, east end. So he's no stranger to Ogden Dunes. And so our mission here tonight is to uh, review what Dan is going to talk about. I know he's uh, put together a PowerPoint and uh, we can walk through that PowerPoint. Uh, our mission tonight is not to debate uh, Dan's proposal, but rather to get our questions answered. We do have a regular committee meeting uh, next Monday and we can go through a regular agenda and I'm sure this will be on there too. Uh, so, you know, tonight is not the night to debate. Tonight is the night to ask questions and become more educated as a, uh, as a committee. So uh, as long as uh, we're all on the same wavelength in terms of that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. And uh, Dan, I'm not sure how to give you control of the screen, but Scott's a guru and he's on in case we need, uh, need that kind of help. And if I forget, Scott, at the end of this, uh, we'll, we'll let Dan go, uh, but, but uh, you're going to be gone next week. So I'd like uh, any input that you might have uh, going forward on this, and I'll, I'll try to remind you of that, just in terms of things that we ought to be thinking about from the town standpoint when we get back together next Monday night. So yep, if you drop off, I will track you down. So. <laughs> I'm not planning to go anywhere. Okay, so Dan, you have control of the screen, I assume? I appreciate it. Can you uh, see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you much for taking the time to uh, just listen to a short presentation meant to be interactive. Please uh, stop me, interrupt me, ask questions. I thought about, you know, putting uh, up some images and kind of really uh, presenting a summary of the findings so far, uh, giving you some facts, some ideas, some recommendations for you to consider in uh, your decision what to do next. But bottom line is, you know, it's uh, pretty much a compilation of uh, all the work that we have uh, been doing so far. Um, a couple of things about myself is uh, I have only met some of you so far and been working with uh, uh, just uh, pretty much two of you uh, for, uh, you know, a while. I am a specialized coastal engineer, one of the few uh, coastal engineers around the Great Lakes. I have over 25 years of experience, um, grad school education at the uh, University of Michigan in coastal science and engineering, licensed in eight states, and I lead the uh, uh, coastal practice at GZA around the Great Lakes. Um, as uh, you probably heard, you know, I have been with the project for a while and uh, I'm no stranger to uh, uh, Indiana either. I will only say that uh, to add to my credentials, uh, I'm the engineer of record for some very sizable projects around the Great Lakes for shoreline stabilization, also to provide um, protection against erosion and also to create all kinds of habitat, which obviously was funded at that point by uh, various grants, uh, federal and state. Um, in Chicago, I was the coastal engineer for the Northerly Island Master Planning, never built based on a lot of money, but I was involved with all kinds of big islands, big things around the Great Lakes, and we're looking at multi-million dollar projects. Uh, in terms of um, resiliency around the Great Lakes, I built many projects with $20, $25 uh, million dollars worth of budget. The Lake Superior shoreline was reshaped with the program I led. I was the engineer, record project manager, and the lead engineer. Everything in Lake on Lake Superior in Duluth is subject to 18-foot waves. And obviously, I'm presenting some of these because you, in case you would like to know how much is it in the end to protect the shoreline cost per linear foot, your project versus others, I have all that information. So in Indiana, I uh, have done a lot of work. Um, among others, I worked uh, on the contract with the National Park Service and Army Corps Chicago. I led the shoreline restoration management plan, including obviously Ogden Dunes. I know it's always a contentious battle, you know, speaking of teaming with the National Park Service and they, you know, being part of a team, allowing you to do something along the shoreline. 
but you know, at least I led um, a lot of meetings, uh, all the technical work. I was uh, part of uh, many discussions. I know at the time you also had some uh, questions and, um, you know, bottom line is there's a lot of lessons learned, a lot of good results of the technical work allowing us to put together uh, some good plans for protecting your shoreline. Worked with the DNR, Hammond Beach, um, obviously phase one, I've been dealing a lot of uh, work back in the day for C.J. Gary when they had some money to do something along the shoreline. Majestics Star and many projects for Nepsco Bailey, their water intake. So just a quick recap, you know, um, I was plugged in. It was the time when the, when the town started to look at permitting the permitting battle with the National Park Service, with IDEN, DNR, and the Army Corps. At the time, you know, we looked at phase one versus phase two. So, you know, pretty much the light hatching means a proposed phase two. That was, you know, some ideas that we put together. And I got plugged in from a value engineering standpoint. And I said, look, you know, at the time, it was Roger and Roger leading the charge for the town. I said, you cannot build it like this. You have six, seven foot of water there. What we got to do is envision a phase one being all armor stone and phase two, same thing, armor stone that you build on top of this. So from a value engineering standpoint, we decided all armor stone and one phase because otherwise the cost would go up exponentially and based on the wave activity on the lake, we just couldn't, you know, put in very small stone at the bottom and, you know, make sure that's stable until we come up with, you know, a larger armor stone on top. So... My focus uh, at that time, as I got plugged in and I'm the engineer record for phase one, we wanted to really stabilize, fill with stone and make sure that we have a stable surface, you know, behind the sheeting, which would allow us to work with heavy equipment behind the sheeting for individual placement of armor stone. So we did that. I mean, this is, you probably remember that uh, this is loose property to short drive. Uh, we have an eight foot hole in here, so we lost all that. We had to backfill it and then work closely and, you know, very carefully behind the sheeting to place uh, the armor stone. So we dropping the stone um, in phase one at the shoulder, short drive, and then we have uh, a front loader picking up the stone, transporting that one through the access point, and then you have this um, equipment in here with the grapple system to grab the stone, and then you place it out. So. One of the questions that you had, um, and obviously we debated that during phase one, how do you go about, you know, a potential construction sequence in here and who can um, probably, um, you know, manage that? So one of the things that Steve, you know, um, suggested was thinking of the experience from phase one, nobody was really involved. I mean, you had a lot of time being donated by you, uh, the town members, and I was there a couple of times. So at least, you know, I was there doing the pre-construction meeting, but then I was not really on site. I, I didn't have boots on the ground, so to speak. The construction manager, you know, moving ahead, if you want to hire somebody like that, they will be on site all the time. All the time, there is some construction activity. But the problem is they usually charge 10 to 15% of the construction value. Let's think for reference purposes that you have, you know, a million dollars you know, worth the construction budget, that's pretty much how much they're going to charge. If it's $4 million, then obviously their, their cost can go up to potentially $600,000. So that's a lot. So you also got to think about full-time or, you know, part-time, only at key moments, at typical milestones. For this type of project in my mind, then obviously we're going to look at some slides pretty quick. I think probably my recommendation would be for you to think, part-time, not full-time, because, you know, it's probably uh, some aspects of the project that can be handled, and it's not that difficult. The main challenge you're going to have, besides the construction percent that a construction manager wants to charge, is the lack of experience with coastal projects. I will say this again, you know, even during phase one, it was very hard to find a marine specialized company. And, you know, you probably remember that somebody had a bid, you received a bid from Erosion Marine and their cost was at least twice the cost of the, you know, guys working from the land. So, you know, these are some of the things that I wanted to present to you in terms of facts, you know, and 
hopefully to guide you. Um, construction, uh, you know, being done by a firm, a construction manage management firm versus resident engineer. That means uh, somebody like me or, you know, less senior than I am, you know, and then obviously the cost will go down and you can still probably do something as a hybrid, hybrid approach between some engineering and some town re uh, representation in the field. Anyway, just wanted to present some guidelines in here just to kind of show you that you might have different scenarios and the construction management can be handled in multiple ways. You are a private client. You can do whatever you want with the money. Nobody will tell you that you are bound to uh, invite, you know, different firms to bid. It's your money. You can do whatever you want. And then, you know, looking at the phase one, you have the direct contract with the quarry. The contractor, you know, will not have a markup. And obviously you say you has you save on the taxes. And then you only contract with the firm that will be placing the stone. Probably, you know, this is the best approach for future phases coming up as well. So what do you need next? Next, um, and this is something that we must have, is a new aerial survey. Aerial survey, which has a great, you know, accuracy. I quoted this one, I looked at my guys and we can give you say, if we are to do it, it's about $4,000. It's not that bad. It's a reduced cost because we can tie into the phase one survey that we did. We cannot use the old one. So many things have changed since then. And then obviously for permitting, I know it was one of the questions. We can work again with the Army Corps Chicago. I know the guys, and they know me really well, have been working together for a long time. Same thing in Indiana with the DNR and the Department of Environmental Management. And obviously we need to handle National Park Service, but you know, it's nothing new. So, you know, some of the logistics of the project, we're going to go over, you know, what is being proposed, but you have a unique opportunity to, to use Access 18. It's shaped such as, you know, right now, if we are to access with the trucks, with the stones coming in, I think this is perfect. So you look at Access 18, you go down to the beach, then you can work on the east end all the way to 156, or you, you can proceed towards, uh, you know, 110, and then all the way up to 102. So I think it's possible to work from the beach and you would have the great uh, contractor, you know, handle on how to build it from the beach. They start at the toe and they, they go off with the revetment. This is not to say that I'm recommending a full revetment footprint right here at the end on the West End, but we'll talk about it in just a second. So construction from the beach is by far the most efficient. Uh, it's economical and it's got some great quality control issue, uh, you know, uh, um, quality control um, <clears throat> mechanism because think about it this way, the contractor is safe to work from the beach. You know, they have all the reach they, they need on the horizontal. And then, you know, obviously you observe so many good things, you know, when you place the stone individually and you come up with a knitted layer of armor stones with good neighboring, you know, contact. And I think that's the best way, um, you know, to handle some of these projects, some of the sites. Um, on the West End. The challenge still re remains, and this is something that we didn't work out yet. You have in the middle of the section uh, a series of properties in here that you already know well. These have really tough access, so we still need to figure something out. What can we do between about 86 and 100 short drive, and we need to figure that out. For the other properties, we think, you know, right now we can work like in phase one, Working from the beach is new, and I think it's going to be the best way. But then working from behind the sheeting is the only option that we have left, like in phase one for some of the properties here, um, starting a 64 short drive. So from the beach, we set axis 18. We cover potentially between 156 to 102, uh, potentially even uh, all the way up to 100. This picture on the bottom here is 102, and you see the water level, November uh, 21. It was 580 and a half, and it's a foot lower right now. So we should have 10, 12 feet of just beach right now. And that's not the main issue. Even with this type of condition, if there's no waves, the contractor can go in and they can work in one, one and a half foot of water depth, no issue. 
Uh, they can reshape this, regrade, and then add new armor stone to form a nice revetment. Um, in terms of how we would proceed, you know, how do I envision this? And I think it's probably the only way. So this is uh, Axis 7 and 64. The contractor will use it like they, they used it here. And this is the end of phase one. They would be right here on land and they will play stone. They will start forming a revetment. Why? We need to provide some lateral pressure to the steel sheet piling in here, which is already deflected on top. Once a section of the armor stone was placed, let's say it's 20 foot long, then you start regrading the slope behind the sheeting and then you advance with the equipment, start placing more stone, and then that's, that's how you proceed from east to west, keep building this, and then you advance on land. That's probably the only way because if you are to envision coming in from the water, you can't, it's too shallow, and if they are to use a, a big barge and then a shallow barge and modular sections of the barge, they're going to charge you an arm and a leg for this. It's possible to do it, but it's very, very tricky. And then you are weather dependent. Every time there's uh, waves over one foot, they got to stop the work. So I think that, you know, it's uh, possibly uh, feasible to keep going in a sequence, like I said. And, uh, you know, this is axis eight, we cannot use it. We still need to use seven with we'll slope regrading all the way up to 76 short drive. You place the armor stone first and you keep on going. It's possible to provide a promenade. I know um, we had some questions about it. So we can maintain a 12 foot wide promenade for a linear connection between the east and west ends of the project. And it's potentially feasible to keep it in after we regrade and you know, obviously at the end, uh, restore each single property that's being impacted by the regrading for the construction. So the top, you know, um, portion, I think we probably can do this all the way to, um, I'm guessing, you know, 80, 94, even, um, you know, some, some properties in here can be done by land behind the sheeting, but we still need to work out some final, uh, final details in the design uh, phase of the project. So the promenade is again possible. I know it's probably something that you could use and you would have a nice walk, you know, in the summer uh, evenings or in the mornings and it would be nice to walk just on top of sand. So some tough areas to access, you know, we cannot use some of the access points uh, for a variety of reasons and some mature trees, we just cannot really cut them down. So it's gonna be a discussion in the final design phase on what to do. And then even this one, 100, I pray to God that the water levels will be low because you cannot really work with this property from, from, from the top, you know, from the top of the slope. There's no sheeting and, you know, the slope is too steep. So my only hope is that we can still squeeze in construction and start the 100 coming in from axis 18 all the way down. That's the only way. But I think it's possible if the water levels keep staying the way they are right now. So, you know, as a typical section, I picked this one, uh, you know, so you have the steel sheet piling and, you know, you have some stone, which is good. It's uh, much better than phase one in most locations that we worked in. And that means, you know, you need some armor stone, but a little bit less than phase one. So we would need to come up with a new footprint and about the same elevation at the top of the sheeting and then make sure that we restore the slope at uh, the end of the project. So this would be a typical section based on calculations and obviously for structural integrity of the sheeting here, we need to really protect it on the water, on the lake side. So I think this is a broad discussion and I would like you to ask me questions uh, as a matter of fact for this because we depend on the water levels, uh, big unknowns, and also the beach nourishment of the Portage Beach by the Army Corps. Another big unknown. So if you look at the water levels, they vary. This is a long-term um, you know, representation of the water levels. We are um, reasonably low right now, honestly. We are approaching the long-term uh, historic average of about 579 feet. We are about seven inches on top of that. Now look at the beach nourishment of Portage. So you have April, 2020. It was uh, eroding, uh, the beach was eroding and they had all kinds of problems even at uh, the lakefront here, the pavilion. 
And then this is after the uh, nourishment in 2021, you see a wide beach, but it's also a flat slope, which is not good. And that's usually an indication of a very fine material that they brought in from dredging. Fine sand is not a good beach building material around the Great Lakes and you will not last. It's not expected to stay in place for a long time. And then October 21, you start to erode the beach and you see how some of this is moving. And we saw a lot of movement at those uh, property, a two short drive. We see some deposition behind the Armistone, but everything is moving from here to the west towards Gary. So two big unknowns um, that play a big role in um, your decision or as a team together, you know, what to do with the West End. Hey, Dan, hey Dan real quick, um, when, yeah. you say, when you say that fine sand is not sufficient, is it the type of sand, like what, what would be ideal for something that was longer lasting? Like I said, thank you for asking the question. I, I was really expecting this question and thank you for asking it. Um, you know, I did a lot of research around the Great Lakes. As a matter of fact, uh, one of my papers is actually beach fill material um, and stability. And in here for this type of shoreline, by the way, I was the coastal engineer for, you know, this project as well for the National Park Service, whatever they built at the pavilion, also, you know, that, um, uh, you know, boardwalk on the river. So in here, you need at a minimum, uh, you know, medium sand with a very uh, coarse, you know, medium diameter when comparing to this fine sand. And if uh, you want to look at something that will stay in place for a longer, longer time even, you would need to augment that, you know, under the water on the slope, you need some very coarse sand. So what you have in here is typical for a river discharging into the Gray Lakes and typical, you know, composition is, you know, fine silts and clays and some fine sand, but that's not sufficient. So we need at the minimal, once again, medium sand, which is a lot coarser than what you got now. And you need to augment that on the water side, the underwater slope with some very coarse sand. That's, you know, pretty much ideal because something like that will give you five, 10 years worth of time versus, you know, some, something like this will last for one or two years. And everybody knows that by now. So it, it is the, so if you start at the pavilion and you start to work your way west through Ogden Dunes, if, if there was ever a scenario where we put the same type of sand onto the beach, with the different conditions as you go east to west, would you expect the same type of erosion to happen that we're seeing here in the same time frame? You know, if you um, augment what they have, you know, assuming we just discussing this internally without, you know, going to the National Park Service, it's just our team here. If you are to place a lot of sediment in here, in, even in the West Beach Village here of the Portage uh, Lakefront, if you by any chance can provide some medium sand, this is a beach feeder system. That means you will um, be transported gradually by the waves and go towards the West. But that's a beneficial way of creating a tow, a shallower tow, uh, the tow of the revetment that you have now, and that will obviously break the waves further away from the line of the sheeting. So what you would do in here, assuming that you know you can, you want to benefit, you really would like to benefit from the beach nourishment, you would probably place it here and wait until that one uh, starts to find its way towards the West End. I mean, I. You, you can you can put it you know right in front of two short drive um, and do not if you don't want to deal with the national park service property but then becomes a, a side access you know issue because if you want to place it you know from a barge they need seven eight foot of water depth which you, which you do not have right now versus you know, in here it's an easy trucking or even if they are to place it hydraulically if they ever find a source of dredging that's, you know, coarser than this fine sediment, then obviously, you know, placing it on the beach here is the way to go. I have a question for you. So, so in essence, are you stating that all of the sand that the state has been dumping across all of the rear of Ogden Dunes is basically going to waste? It should just be basically dumping it at the beginning of two short drives? Well, I, I think that there 
their main intent is, you know, obviously to maintain the existing shoreline positioning. So they're nourishing this because they are concerned with, you know, obviously the environment. Now, their main intent is not to protect you, just, you know, this stretch of shoreline, which is obviously available to the public. Now, in reality, you benefit from this sand moving along, you know, the toe of the revetment, but, you know, they would never, you know, probably agree to nourish just in front of your property if you have a problem. They would, you know, obviously worry about this stretch of shoreline, which is, you know, a recreational beach. I hope I answered the question in a politically, politically correct way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess, but dumping at the end of, well, I mean, I get it because this is National Park Service on both ends of us, but I, I'm just wondering, it seems like if everything is flowing in one direction from, what is it, east to west, that we should just be dumping in the east, right? That is correct. As a matter of fact, you know, as part of the shoreline management plan, we looked at many options. And one of them was actually to put in a, an underwater burn, you know, stone burn. So in the near shore, you create a small, you know, structure made out of stone, and you know you can have that to uh, to be uh, fixed. It will not change; it's stable. But that one, you know, will break the waves, and you know whatever sand you got now, you will have it for the next five or ten years instead of you know one or two. Another thing that we looked at is to say uh, do exactly as I mentioned before. You know, look at the different type of nourishment we bring on the beach. They're spending a lot of our money with this fine sand, and it helps them clear, you know, uh, the navigational channel waves because of the commercial traffic, but it doesn't really help. I mean, the public loves it. I mean, you can walk on it. It's fine sand, but it doesn't help you or even the, uh, the environment because with the fine sand, even fish don't like, you know, spawning in this type of material. They, they would like the more coarse type of uh, substrate. So... Finding, that's my main point, my main finding from all the studies that we've done. You need to come up with courses in here if you expect this one to be stable. So unfortunately, you know, they keep, uh, you know, uh, pumping hydraulic dredging primarily, and it's only fine sand. It's not really a good source, not, not something that will be stable. And I'm kind of, you know, disappointed you know, with that regard, but I also understand they are just trying to keep the navigational channel all, you know, open. And for that reason, you know, this is the cheapest way for them to get rid of that material on this stretch of uh, the shoreline. Okay. And, and, and just one other question. Can you quickly speak upon, uh, I guess, gaps in revetment? Well, you know, um, I'm uh, honestly – a firm believer that you never leave uh, gaps in the revetment for a variety of reasons. One, those individual properties that selected not to do the uh, uh, revetment will still be subject to uh, severe wave overtopping. And you've seen it uh, in one of the previous events, you know, the sand behind the sheeting, you know, eroded pretty quick because let's face it, you know, the, the stone revetment will, will prevent that from happening. If you don't put anything in, well, obviously, at those locations, you're going to have some concentrated uh, wave overtopping and erosion. Another thing that concerns me, and it's something that Steve and John and I looked at, in those gaps, you know, we start seeing a little bit of stone displacements. In other words, imagine the waves come in. They will hit the sheet piling. It's a, it's a reflected surface. And then the wave, you know, will go back out. When it does... It, it tries to really displace move. That means some of the armor stones at the toe of the revetment, you know, the properties, neighboring properties that did have, you know, the full revetment build. So we looked at uh, some stone displacements and with time, because of that uh, steel sheet piling section being open, you have reflection and you will um, accelerate the deterioration of the, the armor stone revetment. It's not a hole, so it's got it's not really a full revetment. It's got some holes. Well, the holes will create different holes with time. I'm not saying it will happen, you know, overnight, but it will happen more rapidly than, say, in the case of you having a full revetment. I don't like the situation from a coastal standpoint. Um, it's not good. I think we got to do something at some point, minimum, you know, maybe a half a revetment instead of full, but you really need to limit the wave over topping. And you got to help with the stability of the neighboring sections, you know, on both sides. 
Otherwise, we start seeing some slow movement in the toe. So, so are you saying, I, I don't mean to hog the conversation here. So if we have a homeowner who's situated between two or either side of them that don't participate, are you saying it's better than that homeowner doing a full revetment instead of just doing a half a revetment across the three homes? So the section that's open, that owner, you know, has the uh, partial benefits uh, from a protection standpoint because, you know, typically, you know, obviously if you have straight north, you know, storms, obviously the, the waves will be uh, hitting the shoreline in a perpendicular way. But then if you have any other direction, the waves will be somewhat oblique. So imagine that, you know, for uh, example, northwest waves coming in, well, the property to the west of you will protect you in a partial way. Same thing for the waves, you know, coming in from the northeast um, with the east property uh, by you. So I'm saying it's partial protection that, that you get just because the neighboring sections have the stone with you by, by yourself because you didn't put the revetment in. You can obviously... Um, are a little bit of a, of a fall here to choose the right term because you, you can potentially impact the stability of the storm on your, on your neighbors on both sides. And obviously the way we're topping issue will never go away. Whatever you had before, well, think about it. You know, the waves will keep overtopping that location because there's nothing to break the wave energy before they hit the sheet, sheet piling and that's an open section. Okay, thank you, sir. May I ask a question? Sure, please do. I'd like to go back to the topic of the um, the walkway at the top of the revetment. Yeah. You said that we, you think that we can continue to do those, but are you saying that we need to do those? Because when I look at it, it seems to me that it would be stronger if we continued the angle of, of the stones all the way up to where it would naturally be without including that yeah. ends with a P. Mm -hmm. No, I know exactly what you're saying. I, I think, I think, you know, think about it this way. I'm not saying you should do it. I think you can, if you decide to do it, it's, um, you know, a possibility of continuing the promenade right now, you know, you're looking at 15 to 20 foot wide. That's why you got from phase one. In here, if you want to do a minimum 12 foot, you can. So at the, at, at the end of the project, when all the construction is done, this type of section will look similar to phase one. You're going to have a stone revetment going out, and this one can be flattened and maintained that way with sand and dune grasses. On the other hand, if you wish not to do it, you can also you know, do that. So this slope can be uh, rehabilitated. The promenade will not go this way. And the only thing you're going to have to worry about here is the slope erosion. And you can even maintain something pretty steep like that, whether you put in riprap or not, or just, you know, fill and revegetate. There's a lot of things you as a town can decide on. Where that promenade stops, if it's at the end of phase one, or if you want to continue that towards the west end, it's going to be entirely up to you. I'm just telling you, you can do both options. There are, there are some Go ahead, Sandy. There are some homes where I don't know that they can do it, either because the house is very close to the edge or because we have um, a couple of people who say that they're not going to participate. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm thinking on the West End, not because, you know, this is a great example of what to do or not to do. But in some cases, you know, I remember, um, you know, one short drive was one example. You have a pretty steep slope and you don't have a lot of room. So at the end of the project, obviously, if we are to work from the sheeting, you're not going to have a lot of options. So at that point, you know, I think that owner will be uh, strongly against the promenade to be left in as a permanent option because, you know, the distance between the edge of the sheeting and his house is, is reduced. I know exactly what you're saying. So I think you have a lot of just internal discussions coming up, you know, what to do, um, you know, with this promenade What's going to happen? What's the future at the end of the construction project? I think that's something that probably you should decide on. Yeah, and just to piggyback on that, so can you talk a little bit about just the access? Because one of the things I find interesting about the the promenade is, you know, as we think about 
long-term care and maintenance and just having access along there. And the, the other thing is if, if we start with a phase one, which eventually morphs into a phase two, would that promenade be something that, that we should be considering pretty strongly, just again, to make sure that we can do future work, whether it's phase two or just ongoing maintenance of care? Yeah, I think, uh, Scott, it's, uh, it's great. I think you and I touched base on this one a little bit from my engineering you know, standpoint, my simple engineering mind and from a practical standpoint as well. It's always good to have it, you know, yeah, think about it, you know, for not only the public to enjoy if that's what you want, but also for, uh, you know, say maintenance. If something is to happen with some of these stones, I picked this one because it's by one opening. If you ever, you know, need to come back here, construction access is possible. And they're not going to charge you an arm and a leg. This is, you know, ample space for them to use. And I think for going back to one of the, uh, you know, project areas, again, if something is to happen for maintenance purposes, it's always, it's always good to have it. You know, that's, that's pretty much why I suggested, you know, you can think about it. Um, it can happen, you know, keep it in or not. But I think once again, for just having quick access to the shoreline, even for emergency purposes, you know, God forbid some emergency situation is here and, you know, an ambulance needs to come, sure, they can go on a short drive, but what if they need to come here? And sometimes, you know, problem comes in from the water. What if there's going to be a boat and somebody, you know, hits the uh, revetment and we need some emergency response pretty quick? Uh, well, at that point, the, the, the promenade is it. Yeah. Well, based, based on the, the work that's been done and what you know about the conditions, how, how frequently do you think we're going to be needing to supplement the armor stone? Just again, ongoing care. The, those gaps concern me a little bit, but is this something that would be happening every year, every five years? Like what, what does that look like? So let's talk a little bit about the maintenance. What do we do around the Great Lakes? You know, the coastal structures are typically designed for 25 to 75 years. Um, you know, this is the typical uh, time frame. you know, how long they last. But I will tell you, uh, in my career, 25 years or more, I've seen that everything last, can last more with some maintenance. That means, you know, for planning purposes, what do you budget for? If you have a $1 million project, you need to maintain, you know, at least as a number, 2% of that per year of the construction cost, and you're not going to use it. So nobody uses this one every year. So in other words, you're not going to have somebody for $20,000 go out there and reshape the stones if you have minor displacement for, for example, from one year to another. But you need to keep this as a budget in mind because, you know, sometimes you might take five years and then you're going to use that $100,000 that you probably planning on saving because of some section of this uh, that, need, that will need some, some work. Um, I think, you know, going back to your question, Scott, and providing you with a straight answer, you don't typically do anything, you know, in the very first five to 10 years of a construction project. If it's built well per the coastal engineering standards, uh, and if the water levels do not go extremely high, like we were in June, July, 2020, and if you don't have really some severe storms, then you should not really do anything. But you, again, it's always good to plan on the 2% because at some point in the next 20 years, you're going to probably end up uh, using most of that equivalent amount at the end of the 20th year. So nobody uses this one yearly once again, but you need to kind of plan on it. At some point in the future, you will have to use it. Maybe in the next 20 years, you have to do a couple of maintenance repairs, but it's really important. And this is, I cannot really stress enough how important this is. You can have somebody like me go out there for four hours every year, but just keeping an eye on some points, I put in here some control points. I would take photos of these. Sometimes, you know, we do an aerial survey pretty quick to look at the individual stone movements. The accuracy is half an inch so we can pick up anything, but just a coastal engineer walking, just walking the shoreline for four hours, you know, everywhere, just to keeping, just keeping an eye on it will give you, uh, as um, say, an early warning. If something is to happen, you will not just, you know, fail overnight. 
you will see some movement. You will see the signs, early signs for that. You just need to keep an eye on it. So an early annual monitoring program is recommended to plan for any future repairs, and you will have some early uh, warnings and detection sign here's what you need to do. So I don't think, once again, you built this last year. I don't think you are expected to do any maintenance for the next five years. But once in a while, you need somebody like me for a few hours just to inspect it, just to keep an eye on it. Hey, yeah. Dan, yeah. this is uh, Steve Coons. I'd like to ask a question about permitting. Uh, to get the permits we did get, we had to sue the National Park and the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, the National Park has just fought us every every day of every week of every year that we've worked for them. And, it, and in some cases, it's gotten personal. Uh, do you nor how, how involved do you normally get on other projects with the uh, permitting process? And by using you, does it kind of insulate things a little bit? You know, honestly, uh, I think it's going to be another battle you're going to have with the National Park Service. Uh, I didn't finalize this report, but I wanted to get some input, you know, uh, from uh, all of you tonight. In my mind, you know, the priority is between 64 and 114. And to give you um, a short answer to a long story here, I analyzed the shoreline uh, between um, 19... Uh, 51 in 2010, and then a little bit over that period of time. And it appears that, you know, what we call dynamically stable, that means you don't significantly have changes in that shoreline uh, from one year to another. So it appears that that dynamically stable condition exists between 114 and 156. So to me, the immediate risk is, you know, all the way up to 114. You always have a little bit of sand, if not, you know, above the water level as a beach that you can enjoy, usable beach, but at least, you know, you have it right there at the toe to break the waves. So we've seen this, um, and this is my analysis for the National Park Service. So I think going back to Steve's question here, the 64 to 114 is a priority. I would suggest that I issue the final report such as this is, you know, emergency repairs. Again, you know, stressing the urgency of implementing the repairs in this stretch of shoreline. And then potentially, you know, you can have another permanent application in the future. Let's face it, the water level is low now. It's a unique opportunity to build something from the beach. But this is not to say that you are in immediate danger on the west end of the project. But 64 to 114 is really a priority. Once, we, once I issue that report, it's a priority. And we can start, you know, the formal permitting process and see how things go. They, if they have any objections, it's hard to believe because the coastal analysis will be clear. This is an urgency. It's a repair that needs to be done right away. What you have along the shoreline is not enough, you know, for the storms that we have had in the last couple of years. And, you know, let's face it, the, um, the uh, precedence is in place. We built a lot of project shoreline in phase one. I just don't know how continuing that work and allowing the same level of protection for the neighboring properties will be um, the same type of resistance from the National Park Service. I think it's very unlikely they will react the same way they did at the, at the beginning of the permitting for phase one. That's my long story short, Steve. Sorry to kind of really tell you a lot, but I wanted to put out, out there the shoreline evolution study that we did as well. So you would advocate kind of two permits, one from 64, 114, and then another one to the west of there, if I'm seeing this correctly? So I think it can go as, as one permit or two. The way I see it, the big battle will, will be to get this one, the 64 to 114 as a priority. And then, you know, potentially based on the coastal risk that you're willing to take on, let's face it, the west end is not looking at the same level of coastal uh, protection need, uh, such as the 64 to 114. So obviously, the, not only that, for now, um, you know, we have uh, a lot of beach there being built, but uh, let's face it, you know, the, the West End with the sheeting and an existing revetment, 
you know, that can protect the shoreline a lot better than some of these properties between 64 and 114. So again, I would like to suggest you thinking about this one as an emergency type of permitting, getting this one out through the system, and then obviously dealing with the rest of the property in, uh, in two phases. I think for them, it's easier to digest one pill instead of two in one shot. So maybe that's something for you to think about. Are we, are we even asking for the same permits or for the same entities for both of those sections, or is that going to be different? So, you know, again, it, it's, it's a question of, you know, coastal risk for the West End. I mean, you know, look at what we got here. Obviously, we can't even imagine the ways, you know, scouring of all of this. This is, by the way, a buried, you know, stone revetment. You know, I know for a fact I've seen pictures. So what you see here is not just, you know, all the revetment. It's, you know, it extends further out and it's, you know, deep. So I think what we need to, to plan on is augment what we have, add a little bit more stone revetment. The top of the sheeting here on the west end is in between 591 and 593 feet. This is pretty much, you know, all the elevations in between this 592 that we built phase one to. And assuming as a worst case scenario, you know, all the beach goes away, water levels go back up. You're going to look at some scenario where, you know, the existing revetment is too, too low and therefore you need to augment that one with some additional revetment. But in the eyes of the Army Corps, I work with them a lot. When they see this type of situation, they will say, why do you even need it? I mean, look at the beach they have in front of it. So that's why I'm kind of guiding the conversation, you know, grabbing their attention towards 64 to 114 as a priority right now, because we got water at the toll, you know, pretty much at the toll of the sheeting versus, you know, the West End being a totally different existing condition. So, I have a question uh, about maintenance. Sorry. For, for sections that have smaller sized armor stone, so you just, you just showed a slide that called out a one to two ton armor stone on the east side we have you know four to five to, to sometimes six tons is there a, a, a larger maintenance issue with the smaller stone the smaller tonnage versus larger so again if if you decide assuming that, that there'd be more movement with smaller well i think you you asking the right the right question here don't get me wrong um even, even if we are to build this this way, you know, if you look at the sizes here, you know, some of some of these stone sizes are in that range, one to two, two and a half tons. And on the phase one, you know, with water level being, the water level being pretty much at the toe of the sheeting, we had to use three to five and a half tons. So going back to exactly your precise question, if we assume that the water level will not go all the way back here. And assuming we're going to have still a little bit of beach sand that we can retain here, even in a worse, you know, case, worst case scenario, we can build this revetment with, the, with, you know, a full section that we're putting in all the way to the top of the sheeting. But the stone will be, um, you know, I mean, can be a little bit smaller than, you know, obviously the, uh, the east end. Will the maintenance be different? No, I think, you know, based on the conditions, one to two tons in this type of, you know, shallower type of water condition that we're gonna have in the future will be the same as three to five tons on the east end. So we're not really looking at the one to two ton being less stable than three to five. If the, obviously the conditions here, the, the shallower depth that will exist along this project end, you know, on the west end, will be obviously the key factor in, you know, allowing us to have one to two tons stable. Again, I'm providing some recommendations in here based on, I think, the coastal risk would be, which I think in my professional experience is going to be less than what the East End will be. Let's not, you know, forget that during the project construction of phase one, we started with the water depth of two short drive, a seven foot. It was reduced with time after placing the beach nourishment at the Portage uh, Lakefront. But, you know, that seven foot of water dipped in front of the sheeting scared all of us because, you know, <laughs> we were kind of close to not even uh, being able to put three to five and a half tons, you know, if the water level would be maintained to seven, eight, nine foot of water dip, then obviously we need even bigger stone. So long story short, I think it's possible that we end up with one to two tons and the maintenance will not be 
any different than you know any other any other place on phase one. Got it. Thanks. Can, can you expand a little bit more about in the beginning of your conversation? You you talked a little bit about if, if if this is going private versus public. We have the autonomy to make our own decisions and and do things like that as far as where to buy a quarry from things like that. But as far as funding goes, I guess on the opposite end, you, you listed some brick uh, funding and things like that. All of those are public. Um, funding and none of them are, I, I guess, reimbursement funds. So, wh wh where does the funding tie into all of this? Because even if you go through a brick program or any of the other fundings that I saw listed on your slides, I mean, th those take a couple of years to go through. So, what what are, what are some options here, or, or can you clarify that just a little bit for me? Not a problem. So we provide all the services, you know, needed for Coastal Project in-house. You know, what's really working in our advantage is that we employ as a full-time, you know, grant specialist, one guy that was very high up with FEMA. He was one of the guys, uh, managers, that uh, was in charge with reviewing and approving, you know, these projects for grants on the East Coast. So he's now working with us. He's been with us for a couple of years. And he formed a group for, uh, you know, grants and support. And, you know, they are certified with the benefit cost analysis, all kinds of tools, you know, that FEMA folks really like. And there are two different ways. The brick, the building resilient infrastructure in communities. It was a disappointing first year. Uh, people that applied found out that, you know, you had thousands of applications and, you know, a very small percentage of those uh, applicants were, received the funding. So I think break is a possibility, but I think, you know, from our experience and what we've seen, it's a national review type of uh, competition, national competition and national review level. So I think it's pretty competitive and you want to have a small chance. Honestly, uh, we help some other communities around, uh, around the Great Lakes, but it's kind of a waste of uh, time. It's a shot in the dark. On the other hand, here's another one that I think is going to be really applicable that has a mitigation program. It's still funded by FEMA, but it's on a regional state level. This is where I think um, you would have the most chances of getting, um, you know, money. If you by any chance getting the hazard mitigation funds, um, again, state review, regional, and you're getting a few million dollars, I think it's very possible that you, that you will, and we can help you with that. Uh, in that case, Yes, you got to go to public bidding on a lot of the things because they do not want you to go so source if uh, you got to demonstrate that this is the best bang for the dollar that you can get through the public opening and bidding. I have a question. <clears throat> I have a question about the very west end of the town. Um, if, if, if we were to have another high water mark and erosion like we saw in the last three years, um, I think that the the uh, erosion would really uh, impact access 19 and the adjacent property. And I wondered if it isn't wise to wrap the revetment around that corner uh, in anticipation of another three or four year period of high water. Absolutely. I mean, that's something that uh, I was gonna put in the report and I totally forgot. I looked at you know the work uh, being done. I looked at some of the grading. I think you bring up an excellent point. You know, it's never safe to just, you know, put a structure out there or some other things or even say regrade it. you got to wrap up the revetment and protect that corner. Absolutely right. And, and Scott, isn't that something the town is looking at, though, separately? Say, say that for, for around the West End? Yeah, around Access 19, isn't the town looking at something? Or? Uh, there's been some conversation with the Jensen's. I'm not quite sure where that conversation resides at the moment. Okay, all right. But, but yes, it's been discussed. Okay. Well, and I have a question. Um, I understand uh, the 64 to 114 being a priority. But it makes more sense to me if you're going to be bringing heavy equipment and stones in, particularly down access 18, um, 
which is adjacent to several homeowners that when we did the project at the West End the last time required uh, monitoring for uh, soil movements so that their foundations weren't impacted by the uh, you know, load carrying traffic going down that access way. So it, it makes more sense to me if we're going to do a project that goes down that access way to go ahead and do it all the way to the West End, even though it's in quotes dynamically stable. Um, I think everybody would love to see us be able to reestablish a, a dune there but it doesn't make sense to go to the expense of bringing sand in and planning it only to come back, what, a year or two later and tear it all up to put in additional armor stone to make that short area from uh, 148 to 156, uh, you know, up to standard with the proposal that you've got on board there, Dan, with bringing it up to the top of the the steel wall and adding armor stone of larger size. So mm -hmm. I, I do understand the, I guess my question is why I, it may be easier for the Army Corps to swallow that pill, but I, I just, I don't see the sense in breaking it into two separate phases. Sure, no, it's an excellent point. Again, you know, I would love, you know, I'm the type of guy that wants to build a lot along the shoreline and, you know, disturb this once and be done for good. Because, you know, if you do that, if you have, uh, say, a longer construction time, and obviously it's going to cost more, but, you know, once you are done, then, you know, you can talk about things that we personally love about, you know, uh, soft, you know, restoration of the project, you know, putting in landscaping, uh, you know, dune grasses, all kinds of things that you can do. And you can be creative with a lot of things on the upper slope. In other words, putting in more stone based on your question, you know, we always see it as an opportunity. You have more fill and you increase the cost. But once you do, you are able to stabilize the upper slope. And that will give you a lot of opportunities for, for landscaping, as I said. And I think it's also better for the ecosystem, you know, for a lot of reasons to actually have that in place on the upper slope and that to be restored. So I would love to have this uh, in place, but I also wanted to give you the hard facts of, you know, you're gonna be up against a battle with the regulatory and, you know, what you decide is up to you. In my mind, you know, as I said in, uh, um, you know, one of the slides here, you can have one or two permits. It's entirely your decision, but I respect, you know, the opinion that you know, we're going to have to disturb this anyway. Why don't we go in, fix everything in one shot and be done? Can we get a permit for that? You know, if you decide to go with only one permit, we'll find out how, you know, type of, uh, what type of resistance we're going to get. So again, the question is one or two permits. Do we go from 64 to 156 all the way to the end? Or do we break it out in two permits in two construction uh, seasons? I personally would love to see that upper slope being restored and, you know, obviously giving uh, that some attention as well. So this is Steve. Why don't we talk about that uh, Monday night, you know, one permit versus two. I think it was a good point to bring up, but I'm also sensitive of time here, 7.30, you know, we, I'm sure Dan will stay. Uh, Scott, I'm assuming we can continue on past an hour on your Zoom here, right? Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay, so maybe Dan, talk a little bit about next steps. How do you see this thing unfolding? And what are the next steps and what's the timing? So the next step is obviously, you know, right before we do the permitting, you know, for, uh, you, know you would allow me to continue working with you, which I would love the opportunity for that. Um, you know, the next step is to do actually an aerial survey. Uh, there's a lot of errors in the previous survey that was collected in the, you know, uh, 
all permitting, and thank God there's not a lot of errors in the phase one, but uh, phase two and three, so half of the project, yeah, you cannot really trust that survey. It's, it's not good at all. So we need to collect that, not only for that uh, reason, but also uh, based on the fact that the conditions changed, you know, over the past three years or so. And uh, that's gonna be the phase, you know, the immediate, you know, need of the project, an aerial survey. And I said like 4,100, something like that, that would be our, our cost. And once we assemble that, we need to um, kind of determine what is the best course, course of action? You're gonna you know, internally decide one or two permits, what's a priority for implementation. And then we need to really figure out based on that, you know, project area one or two or one project in, you know, in, in uh, entirety between 64 and 114, how are we gonna designate the access for construction? I see potentially some very top construction working from behind the sheeting like I said, in one portion of the shoreline, everything else can be done from the beach. So kind of really looking uh, carefully at how can we figure out the, the temporary staging areas and the access you know, points, I think that's going to be another important priority for us as a team. So you let me know where you decide on the permits. And then based on that, we're going to really need to kind of finalize the uh, uh, you know action plan, which is what type of design development sections we're going to select and uh, right after that you know submit the permit application um, answer all the questions and hopefully if uh, you know like i said you want to apply for some grants we can help you with that we can do if it's a one project and you know type of sequence and if you have some money we can start in the fall this year if you want to you know pretty much line up all the facts you know, apply for all the grants this year, have a shovel ready, uh, construction ready uh, project with plans and permits in hand and do the construction next year, you can do that as well. So lots of flexibility, but in my mind, permitting as soon as possible, that will be my strong recommendation. That will take a while. And how long do you think construction would take? Well, let's say we're looking at just, uh, you know, 64 to 114, and we're not doing anything on the West End. If we figure out the temporary uh, staging areas and the access points, and if you do the same thing, you, you want to secure a contract with the quarry, and you pay for the materials, and you secure that in place, this is, you know, uh, a three-month construction job. You know, if, you know, we hire some good competent contractors. I was, you know, not disappointed with, the first guys that you had, Steve, Steve on the job because, you know, they were reasonably uh, inexpensive, you know, uh, but I think, you know, it was a learning curve. The guys that were, I worked with and I was there for just two days, just wrapping around that corner, you know, a two short drive on loose property. I think they did a really good job tightening everything, placing the stone. So it's a learning curve, but I think it's a three month job for, for somebody that has a couple of crews and they can work in a couple of different spots. Um, and what if it did continue all the way down to 156? Because, you know, there's that a significant amount of rock revetment that wouldn't need anything being done. And then Correct. from 148 to 156, it's additional stone, like in your drawing there on the left. So really, we're not talking about a huge addition from 148 to 156. Absolutely. So I think if they have multiple crews in here, I mean, look at the beach, you know, it's the, it's, it's a dream, you know, job for a contractor or a coastal engineer like me, having this type of access, you go down to the beach and you start laying the stone, putting that one in place. It's, uh, it's, it's the easiest job ever. So I still stand behind what I said, you know, no matter what the project is, you know, even if we are to continue here, and go all the way to the West End, it's still a three month job if multiple contractor you know, teams are in place. That's not okay. A and I just had one more question. Yeah. If, if we did place additional stone from 148 on down to 156, is that pretty much the extent of it? Is placing stone on top of it, or is that whole toe stone that is in there going to have to be? <laughs> disturbed and reconfigured 
from the pictures I looked at, and obviously, you know, I would, uh, you know, do a trench bit. Say, for example, we get in some somebody uh, on the contract right before they start placing the stone. We need to verify some of the design assumptions. I mean, just looking at the construction pictures, this revetment goes down deep and it goes further out. So for that reason, you know, putting in just this type of armoring on top, you know, call this uh, addressing, you know, of the existing uh, armor, you know, stone revetment. Only this little bit that we're putting on top, I think this will be sufficient. Sure, in here, right at the location of the new toll, we would place, you know, a larger, a little bit, you know, type of armor stone, but then going back up and, you know, placing this one on top and capping what we have, you know, we would probably do just this little bit without excavating, you know, uh, intensively here and looking for any signs of the stone because I already know it's there. But we would have to just double check before we do this. We're going to have to contract a dig a hole here and see what we got underneath. If we're good to go, then this is it. And we continue all the way to the uh, 156 end. And then theoretically, after that was done, you could come back in with sand and reestablish that dune all the way down to the beach and cover that over so that you'd had a dune and no armor stone protruding you at could. that location because yeah. of the elevation of the dune behind the steel wall. Yeah, I mean, everything below uh, the ordinary high water mark, you know, a lot of people were arguing, we need the permit and we have to, but, you know, starting with some particular elevation, if you are to cover this in sand, and look at um, you know anything you want to do here to come up with a milder slope here starting on top of this uh, stone revetment you can okay thank you so dan this is dave snyder and i have a couple of questions i guess the first is if you were to uh, in your original presentation from 64 to 114 in conversation you talked about uh, having a gentle slope from the back of the seawall to uh, the edge of the property uh, of the homeowner's property, I guess, to mm -hmm. uh, grade that to uh, so that it's not so severe. Uh, but then we also discussed having a walkable uh, promenade behind that wall. And wouldn't, in some situations, that walkable promenade uh, require a secondary uh, seawall or some type of retaining wall at the homeowner's edge of their property? Uh, if not, it's going to be an issue, I think. Oh, hundred percent. You know, it's uh, it's a great question they have. I mean, look at this uh, type of quick, um, you know, shot. I think this one is uh, probably eighty. No, this is axis nine. Yeah, this is axis nine. So this one should be, uh, I think, uh, eighty short drive. So this one is a different situation. You got a mile slope, and if we are to flatten this one out, cut it to the elevation of the sheeting and maintain it as 12 foot wide, it's not gonna be a problem for transitioning into you know, the upper slope because we're looking at just a couple of feet of difference. By contrast, if we keep going to the west end and suddenly we got a 10 foot drop, you are absolutely right. If we cutting into this and say, this is a 12 foot wide promenade that we're putting in, then we need to regrade the slope back. So this owner will lose a little bit of the property, the grassy area that we have in here and we can come up with something steep. You don't need another retaining wall, which is expensive. We do a lot of uh, geogrids nowadays that we're putting on top of this, and we obviously fill them. And if we vegetate them, you know, they're going to be okay. So something steeper, like one and a half to one side slope would work out. You do not need a wall, but the prerequisite is, and I'm going to be honest with you, we got to shave off. We got to recreate a little bit of the slope, you know, on the upper portion. So the, this property will lose a couple of feet because we need to go towards, uh, towards the house just to kind of be able to end up with a reasonable type of uh, slope so it's not too steep. Otherwise, if we don't want to cut, then another retaining wall will be needed along here. Thank you. So is the 12 foot the minimum you need for a promenade? Well, the 12 foot is usually the guideline you know, obviously some contractors, you know, can use a little bit less than that. But for one-way uh, contractor access for heavy e equipment, we're looking at 12 foot. Because at 80, it jogs back about four to five more feet. That's what I'm asking. So you're going to do that? 
yeah, in here will be kind of <laughs> kind of weird because of the transition right here between, um, I think this is axis nine, but this, as we go west, the sheeting here is actually um, out about six and a half feet offshore of this alignment. So the alignment of the sheeting here goes another six and a half feet out. So in a way, it's, it's kind of a jagging alignment. So you come off a 12 foot here, then you got to go this way and kind of, you know, turn. So I know okay. it's not really a straight answer here. I wish it was a straight wall, but in some cases we just need to adapt. So the promenade will turn in here and obviously it's not like, you know, you can do a 90 degree angle. You've got to come in here behind and then start coming up with a, with a nice radius on the turn. Okay. I don't have all the final design questions yet. I know there's going to be a lot of discussions you're going to have, but, uh, you know, in terms of constructability, it appears that, you know, we can still work behind the sheeting. We have an excellent opportunity to work on the West end from the beach axis 18. How far, you know, East can we go? Probably even all the way up to a hundred, but you know, the questionable area would be right. Those properties between, you know, 80 and a hundred, it's, it's going to be tough, tough working conditions. So across all the states that you uh, showed in the beginning that you're licensed with, what, what is the price, a good price per linear foot for a stone revetment? So all these projects that, uh, you know, I've done and I've done a lot. So from going to something like this, the shoreline is pretty much destroyed. There's not much left. This used to be their boardwalk, uh, their promenade. And from, from this type of situation, we go to this lower, uh, you know, left bottom here. This one was $3,200 per foot to build a revetment, a concrete wall, this boardwalk and repave. So this was for active, you know, type of recreation. This is for passive. That means people that go slow. And this is for biking and rollerblading. The revetment was brand new. So this from here to here, $3,200 a foot. Now, by contrast, this which is a really, really different story. This is the uh, Cadillac of the options. The armor stone here is six to nine tons. The toe stone is 10 to 12 tons. So we're looking at stone that's, you know, pretty much the height of a regular guy out there. Um, and then everything else on land was redone, including uh, stormwater detention, infiltration ponds. This one in, ended up to be $4,500 a foot. So you are looking at, you know, about $2,800 a foot for what we did here. And, you know, obviously these projects, this one is in line and a little bit more expensive. The cost between yours and this type of restoration project is the cost of the wall, the country wall. Okay. So 3,000 is a good good number to, to, to baseline with, right? That's correct. And, you know, any breakwater around the And, you know, obviously slope down again. That type of cost just for the breakwater is $5,000 per foot. It's a lot of stone to put in. But in terms of a good planning number, what we got a target here, 3000 a foot is very reasonable. Okay. Yeah, I think in the uh, the aerial survey, this is Steve, that's part of the reason the aerial survey is needed to be uh, not only for the permitting, but also to determine how much rock would be needed you know, for each of the addresses, so just know that. And, you know, Steve, it's not fair that, you know, initially, uh, initial efforts here, you know, show the brand new revetment and equal share. Well, it's not really like that because honestly, if you have all the stone in place, you know, think about it this way. We decided that it's not practical in, on the east side to place in, you know, small stone like this and then, you know, obviously come up with larger, uh, armor stone layer on top. But if you have all this quantity and if we reshape it, and on top of this, we put in, uh, you know, the armor stone, you know, that should result in some savings. It's not like, you know, we have a full revetment footprint with 100% new stone. This one needs to be subtracted. The only cost of doing this work is the regrading, which is not going to be an arm and a leg. 
usually regrading is one third of you know all the uh, quantity you know to buy it and to place it you know a full revetment section is unfair to claim for this guy this property owner right here because he's already got some good armor stone and you know obviously some smaller stone we can put to good use but only a, a, an aerial survey can determine you know exactly what we got and then we do a volumetric analysis and you know obviously his cost per linear foot would be lower than say another property that has no stone whatsoever. So you bring up a good point. Okay, any, uh, I'm a little <coughs> sensitive uh, at time, but uh, does anyone else have any questions of Dan? And uh, if you happen to think of a question later, we can uh, shoot it to Dan as well. So yeah. um, please. Steve, this is John. I, uh, Dan, I, I, I just wanted to ask you, from your experience, we could discuss this more on Monday at our next meeting, but from your experience, what would you suggest as a permit request? The entire uh, property from 64 to 156 and let the, and let the uh, you know, uh, specific groups make a decision on what they would permit, or would it be better to make a permit request for that section 64 to 114 to get the project moving? Do you, do you think, uh, what would you suggest is the best uh, method? Let them edit it back or us edit it at the beginning? John, I think it's it's the main question we need to, you know, answer as a team, I guess. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, I mean, as a coastal engineer, I would like to protect the shoreline. It's my duty to say, you know, what we have is insufficient. Let's, let's make it a better project, resilient, and as uh, we just discussed, you know, we go in, disturb the shoreline, might as well just do it once. And then right after that, we come up with great ideas, you know, sand nourishment on top of the uh, hardened stone. We come up with a milder slope, we thinking revegetation, landscaping, so many other opportunities. So I'm kind of, my mind is inclined to say, Lane, let's go that route. On the other hand, um, I want to, you know, remember and not forget how tough it was for us to get a permit of any kind for phase one. So for that reason, you know, probably um, keeping things on a more practical approach. I know the guys in the, in, in the Chicago Army Corps District, Paul Leffler, they're biologists. Um, I worked with them many times, you know, during permitting uh, in Illinois, Indiana. So I think, you know, having a less of an impact, less fill that we're proposing on the open bottom so if we are to permit just a 64 to 114, that's probably going to go easier uh, as one permit initially than say applying for a whole permit. Again, you can go either way, but I think on the practical approach, I would probably suggest thinking less in this particular case. So one, one project 64 to 114 is a phase one in the permitting and the rest to, to come up you know, later. Ex okay. Excuse me, there is a third option. C couldn't we go down to 124, 122? Um, and at that point, we've run into where we left off when we finished the West End. Rogers Home. For those of you who live in town, you know what I'm talking about. When, when the West End was started, they started at Rogers and went west. So the West End has some work done. <clears throat> Roger and Jill have all of their work done. Yeah. And nothing has been done up to 122 or 124. So the entire middle section. So you would say um, apply for a permit between 64 and 124? Yes. Yeah, we can do that as well. You know, I mean, the more we go towards the West End, the better, because, you know, some of these properties, uh, as we just discussed, will be able to, uh, you know, be built from the beach. So 124 is there. We have enough beach to build it. And then we can go um, both this section all the way to 104, 102, and potentially even 100, all the stretch, all the way to 124, 
will be built from the beach. So again, you know, could be three options there. Okay. I, I just, I just wanted, you know, again, I just wanted to come up with some facts. You know, we studied the shoreline. I was in charge of that, and I presented some of the facts in terms of, uh, you know, how do you classify the shoreline based on the evolution of the sand, you know, in front of the sheet. So that's why, you know, the dynamic condition that I refer to, you know, pretty much uh, starts at about 114. But on a practical side, if we want to enlarge this and go all the way to 124, sure, I don't see any problem with that. We're looking at just another, you know, three properties that we would add to what you said. Okay. Any other questions for Dan? Okay. Having heard none, Dan, thank you very much. I'm going to ask everyone else to stay on, though. And uh, Dan, thanks a lot. And if we have other questions before the meeting Monday night, we'll get in touch with you, okay? Well, again, it's my pleasure. Um, I would love to keep working. Let me know what you need. I'm here and uh, I'm less than an hour away. And Steve knows it, you know, every time there was a meeting, I love to drive, get out of the office. And, uh, you know, this is what I do. And, uh, you know, happy to work with you and let me know if there's anything else. And uh, I will be able to jump on that and address all the questions on the spot. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Good Thank night. Thank you much. Thank you. Bye. Thank Thanks. you, Dan. Uh, so with uh, Dan leaving, uh, Scott, I know you're on vacation next week, and I don't know if Dave or uh, Bernadette are going to carry the torch, but for that meeting Monday night, I, I would like, you know, for the town's position to the extent they have one to be known. I, I mean, uh, you know, ultimately it's going to be a town project, and we just, I want to make sure that we get all the input from the town. I mean, we're not going to, as a committee, you know, we can't make any decisions. Uh, we have to come back to the town for approval, but certainly we'd be making recommendations. So I don't know how you want to handle that in terms of making the town's thoughts, recommendations, objectives, positions known. Yeah, I, you know, I, that, that's a, <laughs> that's a loaded question. So my, my knee jerk you know, just kind of going through this tonight. Um, one, I think permits is going to be super critical. Um, I, I'm encouraged to hear Dan say that it should be easier, but given the history, I am I'm definitely suspect. So I think getting the permits uh, going, I think sooner rather than later is going to be important. Um, I think the conversation on the Promenade is going to be important because I do believe that we do need to have good access to uh, the work that's done for long-term care and maintenance and, and to minimize those ongoing costs. Um, you know, beyond that, you know, just a couple of things that, that kind of swirling in my head, I feel like it's going to be super critical to have a good project manager uh, for this work. Um, and the, and the last thing, and, and I don't know that we did it last time, is we always have to be respectful of public bids. Um, anything over $25,000 has to go through a formal public bid process like we're doing currently with our uh, recycled garbage pickup services. So, you know, the good news is we've got, I think, some time to sort through that part of it. But that, that's just kind of my knee jerk in terms of what I think is going to be on the, the, the minds of the, of the town. Um, but I've shared with you before, I, I, I feel like we got to strike while the iron's hot here and move forward and get whatever work we can get done, done soon, because the more time we get away from this and as the water starts to retreat, you know, I don't want to fall into complacency. So I think we do need to move on this fairly quick. And that's just kind of my initial thoughts. Okay. That, that's helpful. And, uh, didn't ma mean to make the question that loaded, but maybe I did. I don't know. Uh, uh, just, there's a lot of complexity here, and you know, we we've got this uh, 
lawsuits still going. Uh, we're hoping to hear something next month. Uh, it, could that come into play with the next phase here? Uh, who, who knows at this point, but I think it's important, uh, something we need to keep on our radar. So again, there's just, I think there's just a lot of layers to this, but I, I my own self, I won't speak for the other council members, but I do feel strongly that we, we need to move forward with with work and, and as much work as we can get permitted and done. Okay. Dave, Dave, well, everyone... Dave had to run. I don't know, Bernadette, if you have any other thoughts or comments, you're on mute. Bernadette, you're on mute. Okay. Um... No, I thought Scott gives his thoughts and then he leaves town and then, you know, <laughs> the rest of <laughs> um, No, I would agree. We definitely have to go with the permits. Uh, I thought some of the information shared by uh, Michelle was interesting too. You know, do we consider that if we can get the permitting? Again, I'm kind of new at this, but I thought that was another something to at least consider, not to totally rule out carte blanche. I think we need to think about that. Um, I know the project manager would be expensive, but I think we need it based on my knowledge of what's going on and what's gone on in the past. And the bidding process for sure. We... Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm open to all of that. You know, the promenade, there's some positive about that and we may need that in some areas, may be mandatory as opposed to just, we wanna do it. It, Dan's a pretty interesting guy, so it sounds like he, he's in a position to, to potentially help on several fronts, whether it's project management, permits, uh, funding. Uh, so I, I think I'd like to kind of think through that a little bit more, too, because he seems like a pretty pretty knowledgeable, resourceful guy. So um, it, it, we need all the help we can get. I was interested in his funding, that he had more knowledge in the funding area. And I think that would be very helpful. Peter, did you have something to say? I saw you raise your hand. I think you're on mute too. You're on mute, Peter. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, uh, again, I'm, I'm new to the committee, but I was certainly impressed uh, by Dan's knowledge, uh, diplomacy and uh, breadth of experience and, and you're right, the background that he has in his own department to do these funding uh, uh, surveys and maybe get us some, some federal funds to, to help, um, even for maintaining the, the, uh, the project in the future. So yeah, I was really impressed. And I think his advice, his advice we should try to follow as closely as we can. That's all I have to say. All right, well, yeah. I think most of our meeting Monday night's gonna be dedicated to this topic. Uh, so I want everyone to think about what they've heard, reread what Dan has done in terms of the slides. Uh, you know, we're not going to make any decisions Monday night, but I think we should move towards, uh, a recommendation or a series of recommendations uh, for the town to consider. Uh, so just kind of think about it and come armed to the meeting with your thoughts and, uh, you know, we're into a new year and I agree with everybody. I mean, one of the problems in history is that when the water levels went down, then work stopped. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I really wish that never happened. And I think as a group, we should try to make sure that doesn't happen, you know, where we're at right now. So, you know, let's, let's get prepared. Let's have a productive meeting on uh, Monday and, uh, come armed with uh, thoughts and questions and and uh, we'll get through it all. And it, it, we're better as a group for sure. So thanks everyone for participating. Yeah, and Steve, uh, just real, real quick, uh, Bernadette, Bernadette and Dave should be there on Monday night. Yes. Right. One quick question. I know the meeting was recorded. How do we get access to that? I, want um, I, I can provide it. it it's stored but this is the town's zoom account so we keep all the recordings on file but i don't know how to access them uh, we can get it to you thank you yep good i think all of our meetings are recorded aren't they scott they, they are correct yeah, i thought so okay uh anything anyone else before we close uh otherwise um 
Uh, over the weekend, I'll put together an agenda, but uh, I think our big topic is this topic for Monday night. So, agreed. Thanks. All right then. Okay. Well, di digest and thank you everyone for participating. And Bernadette, uh, welcome. I'm glad you're going to attend uh, meetings going forward, or I hope you are anyway. So. I'm, I'm working at it. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.